everyone welcome back to my channel so in this video i'll show you a really nice approach to hypercalcemia and all the fhh and hyperparathyroidism all this stuff so let's get started all right guys so there is really three ways by which your body can increase calcium in blood either through increasing its absorption from the intestines so this calcium is coming through diet or from the storage the main storage area of uh, calcium which is from bone resorption or by reducing its excretion in the kidneys and that's by reabsorption of calcium and decreasing its um, wasting in urine right so these are the three ways by which your body can push calcium into the blood and increase serum calcium levels. Now this takes place in several ways, mainly through hormones. The most important being the parathyroid hormone and vitamin D. Alright guys, now it could be done through other stuff and that will be pathological. For example with uh, bone resorption of metastasis, for example. So we're gonna talk about that. Now you gotta know guys that on the parathyroid glands, which are these, we have calcium sensing receptors. These calcium sensing receptors detect when calcium levels go down. When calcium levels go down, these receptors are activated and the parathyroid glands start releasing parathyroid hormone, all right? Now, parathyroid hormone works in several ways to increase serum calcium in blood. Number one, it activates bone resorption and it activates uh, reabsorption of calcium from the kidneys. And number three, it activates the enzyme that, that activates vitamin D. So we have more vitamin D and more absorption of calcium and phosphate from the intestines, as well as more uh, calcium and phosphate retention in the kidneys by vitamin D. This way, parathyroid hormone is maintaining serum calcium in blood in those three mechanisms. So any condition that increases parathyroid hormone levels inappropriately will result in hypercalcemia. Now, what are these conditions? The most common being primary hyperparathyroidism, when there is a parathyroid adenoma when, or carcinoma or hyperplasia, when these parathyroid glands are inappropriately a lot. We have a lot of cells and they're just secreting so much parathyroid hormone that we do not need, inappropriate to the serum calcium level. So even though serum calcium levels may be normal, yet because these tissues are autonomous, they're secreting so much parathyroid hormone. So that's one of the causes of hypercalcemia. Another being that if these calcium sensing receptors are just oversensitive, and if they're oversensitive, they will interpret a normal calcium level of, let's say, 9. They will interpret it as low. And in that case, they're going to keep on secreting a lot of parathyroid hormone as well. So it's the same idea. And that is called familial hypocalcuric hypercalcemia. These families, this is an autosomal dominant condition that runs in families, will interpret a normal serum calcium like this as low. And they will start retaining calcium and that's by reducing its excretion in urine and hence the name hypocalcuric. So the best way to check for this condition, guys, is to measure urine calcium. All right? So this is the second cause of hypercalcemia that is related to parathyroid hormone. Now, other causes of hypercalcemia may not be related to parathyroid hormone at all. And that includes 
causes that are related to vitamin D. Someone may have overdosed on vitamin D and that's called hypervitaminosis D. So this is a third condition, hypervitaminosis D. And we know that vitamin D, guys, increases absorption and reabsorption of calcium and phosphate. Another condition could lead to increased active vitamin D or calcitriol. And these are conditions, guys, that include granulomatous diseases. Because we know that the macrophage has the same enzyme, one alpha hydroxylase inside. So granulomatous diseases such as sarcoidosis or TB and this stuff, anything with granulomas could result in hypercalcemia through this mechanism. All right, guys, so we have two mechanisms related to parathyroid hormone, two mechanisms related to vitamin D, and then we have other independent mechanisms, mainly, really, uh, mainly due to cancer. When we have metastasis to the bone, it essentially releases, as it eats away the bone, it releases calcium. And we also have multiple myeloma that releases osteoclast activating factor to increase bone resorption. So that is a fifth way to get hypercalcemia. All right, guys? So through parathyroid hormone, whether primary or tertiary, and we know that tertiary hyperparathyroidism means that all the glands have become autonomous that's parathyroid gland hyperplasia because of long-standing activation due to uh, chronic kidney disease when we have chronic kidney disease guys and hypocalcemia the body reacts by secondary hyperparathyroidism to try to increase serum calcium if this is long-standing and uncorrected all those active cells of the parathyroid gland become autonomous so that even if calcium levels are corrected, they still release a lot of parathyroid hormone and this is then called tertiary hyperparathyroidism. So we have three conditions that are due to parathyroid hormone activation. We have two conditions related to vitamin D and we have a last condition related to cancer whether metastasis or multiple myeloma. Those guys are the most important causes of hypercalcemia, and I think these are the only causes. So how can I differentiate the two, or the five, actually, or the six? How can I differentiate all these if the only info I have is a high serum calcium level? Now, these guys, this there's an algorithm or an approach to hypercalcemia in order to determine the mechanism because each one has different treatment right so the first thing i'm gonna do is measure serum calcium all right to confirm if i'm suspecting based on the patient's symptoms i'm gonna measure serum calcium to confirm hypercalcemia better do ionized calcium or corrected serum calcium to avoid the fallacies of albumin and this stuff then I'm going to confirm hypercalcemia. I want to know the main or broad mediator here. Is it parathyroid hormone mediated or not? That is the first question I need to answer. Is it parathyroid hormone mediated or not? So the next thing I'm going to measure is serum intact parathyroid hormone. If, if parathyroid hormone levels are high, that is parathyroid hormone mediated. And then I'm between really two or three conditions. I've just narrowed down my differential a lot. So if, if it's high, if it's parathyroid hormone mediated, then it's either primary hyperparathyroidism or tertiary, and I'm gonna know this from the history, it's gonna be really easy from the kidney function tests, or it could be familial hypocalcuric hypercalcemia. To differentiate those, I'm gonna check urine calcium. So this is gonna be my next step. 
So after serum calcium, the next step is intact parathyroid. If intact parathyroid is high, the next step is measure urine calcium. Urine calcium differentiates primary hyperparathyroidism from familial hypocalcuric hypercalcemia. In case of FHH, urine calcium is going to be low. This is because parathyroid hormone reduces calcium wasting. Now, you might tell me that this is also true for primary hyperparathyroidism, but I'm going to tell you that with FHH, serum calcium levels are already normal or just high normal. They're not exceedingly high as would be seen with primary hyperparathyroidism. And so urine calcium is expected to be low. However, with primary hyperparathyroidism, because of the really high serum calcium, eventually urine calcium will be high. Even if parathyroid hormone tries to reduce its wasting, still the severe hypercalcemia is just overwhelming and it's going to have to go down urine anyway. Okay, so the next step is urine calcium. Now I have a diagnosis. It's either primary hyperparathyroidism or it's FHH. So now I have, I've been able to diagnose one of two or one of three. Now let's say serum intact parathyroid hormone is really low or normal. Then this condition or this hypercalcemia is not parathyroid hormone mediated. So I need to check everything else. Right In that case, I'm going to have to check as my next step. I'm going to probably do them together. I'm going to have to check serum vitamin D or 25-hydroxy vitamin D levels to rule out hypervitaminosis D. I can check serum calcitriol right, or active vitamin D. And if it's high, it could be a granulomatous disease. I'm going to start looking for sarcoidosis and such stuff. Then I'm going to start looking for malignancy as well. I'm going to check parathyroid hormone-related protein, which is released by some uh, cancers as a paraneoplastic condition. I can also do serum protein electrophoresis for multiple myeloma. So this is going to be the rest of the workup if it's not parathyroid hormone-mediated or if serum intact parathyroid is normal or low. So let's compare all these causes of hypercalcemia, guys, in this table. I'm going to show you the, how the up and down arrows work here That we know now that we know the next steps. So with primary hyperparathyroidism or tertiary hyperparathyroidism or familial hypocalcemic hypercalcemia, those three conditions, guys, are, have something in common in that there are parathyroid hormone-mediated causes of hypercalcemia. So in all these conditions, parathyroid hormone levels are high, right? And this is different from anything down below where these conditions are not parathyroid hormone-mediated. And so we're expecting kind of a negative feedback and that parathyroid hormone levels will be low, right? Now, let's talk about electrolytes here. Obviously, guys, all these are causes of hypercalcemia. So in all these conditions, calcium level will be high, right? Regardless, whether it's parathyroid mediated or not, okay? How about serum phosphate? Now, that's the tricky point here. Parathyroid hormone, guys, retains calcium and wastes phosphate. And so we're expecting anything parathyroid mediated is going to have low phosphate. But all other conditions that are non-parathyroid hormone mediated, whether it's vitamin D mediated or anything else, will have high serum phosphate. Now, something you should have noticed here, guys, in that tertiary hyperparathyroidism is seen in the setting of chronic kidney disease. So this patient cannot excrete their waste. We're expecting here that only this condition will have really high serum phosphate. 
but all the rest whether this or that is gonna have low phosphate okay now how about vitamin d levels guys now parathyroid hormone we mentioned that it activates vitamin d so we're expecting conditions where hypercalcemia is pyrothyroid mediated to have high levels of active vitamin D, right? Again, you should have noticed, guys, that I'm talking here in tertiary hyperparathyroidism about kidney disease. This patient's tissues that are supposed to have the enzyme that activates vitamin D are not functioning. This patient has renal failure. Right, and this enzyme is seen in the kidneys. So again, here is the exception in tertiary hyperparathyroidism. Do not expect to have high levels of active vitamin D. But in all the rest, yes, we're gonna have high levels of those. How about the inactive vitamin D? It's expected to be low here or normal, normal or low, because it's getting converted into its active form, right? Now, how about hypervitaminosis D? The primary disturbance here, guys, in hypervitaminosis D is that this patient is taking a lot of 25-hydroxyvitamin D or, or D3, right? Or calcidiol. So that is the most important feature here. How about patients who have granulomatous diseases? We have a lot of calcitriol. The primary disturbance here is really high levels of active vitamin D. How about patients with malignancy? Either they have high levels of parathyroid hormone related protein, which I should measure, or that metastasis has led to bone resorption just passively because of interleukin 6 or because of invasion or any of these stuff. Okay? In that case, we're going to have high levels of calcium, high levels of phosphate, low parathyroid as a negative feedback. Vitamin D levels could be normal, guys, uh, whether calcidiol or active vitamin D. All right, guys, with granulomatous diseases, vitamin D levels could be normal, but the most important thing here is active vitamin D. All right, with hypervitaminosis D, even though vitamin D levels are really high, as a negative feedback by the body, the active levels are going to be low because there is a negative feedback control over the enzyme in order to avoid hypercalcemia. So these guys were the up and down arrows of all the causes of hypercalcemia. And here is the approach. What's the next step? I hope you like this video. Let me know what you think.